All right, hello everybody and welcome to what I'm going to call a Lunch King special event. We are here at my family friend, no really, my family is racetrack, rather slot car racetrack, here at my Uncle Jim's house. Now, as you'll see in a moment, this, this track is detailed to the max here, and I could not let this pass us by. I know we're usually a food channel, I know we usually hit restaurants and maybe some travel destinations, but this is just too good to let go unseen. You're actually going to get to be able to hear from the man himself, my Uncle Jim, in a moment, and he will tell you every detail about this track, its story, how he got into it, the cars themselves, and just the amazing journey he had along the way as he was making this piece of art behind us here. So join me guys on this journey. I hope you'll enjoy this special event and uh, well, with nothing else to be said, let's get right into it. So, uh, so Uncle Jim, my dad was talking just a second ago uh, about all the kids coming down here and racing here and as you know as I was one of those kids you know, a couple <laughs> years back I have a lot of fond memories uh, being down here now one thing I gotta ask because I remember it being very chaotic oh when yeah. one of us would crash oh yeah you've made some some drastic improvements when it comes to the you know stopping and starting the race and all yes. that you know, why don't you tell me a little bit about that well as I said before to your dad uh, the cars can't pass each other without going through a hairpin turn and changing lanes and that was simple, simple enough if you're an adult. Yeah. But uh, the, the little kids have a little bit more trouble with it. And they learn to really watch their car all the way around because they may not be able, just like real racing, they may not be able to get by. And uh, it, got, it got a little bit chaotic. So instead of uh, insisting that they yell to the other drivers, my car is down to get their attention so they don't get crashed. I set up a series of lights. Uh, I went to Frankenmuth actually and got a bunch of the first LED Christmas lights that came out. Red, green, yellow. And I took Lego blocks, drilled out the Lego blocks, insert epoxied in the LED, and I ran all those wires back, every one of them back to a, a main circuit board and then up to the controllers so that the kids can push a button and yellow lights would flash for a, a, a local warning light. And if there was a complete stoppage of the race, they would hit a red light and the red light would go on. I had buddies who were colorblind, so I ended up having to put big LED lights up on the walls, which I, sh I should show you later. That's, that's amazing. I, so I remember being on the track and you know having someone scream from across the room <laughs> you know car down or you know i got my car down on the hairpin turn and everyone have to slow down and watch out so that is that's something that will definitely uh make it a little bit easier for those, those do you remember micro on. machines yes, those little when you were a little kid yeah. i had micro machines and i gutted them and took the little uh siren out of them and i set them up so that when you hit the yellow button the siren goes off because right. it still wasn't enough to see the yellow lights they had to hear it to settle down but after about an hour to 45 minutes the kids settle down and then we have a lot of fun well they get the hang of it i i, yeah. I remember uh remember those nights very fondly oh yeah yeah and then uh when you have the adults come in i'm sure it's a little a little easier when it comes to you know regulation but. well you would think it would be but not for all adults really? <laughs> <laughs> some of them have a little trouble with this yeah yeah a little bit of trouble with the trigger discipline i suppose but, but yeah so beside the overarching scenery that my dad was talking about. Uh -huh. I want to get into the nuts and bolts sure. a little bit of the track, how it sure. works, you know, why it's set up in a certain way. So let's have you come on over here and, and we'll talk about the track a little bit. Typically, typically a racetrack has slots cut into it with braided, braided line, but because the car's wheels go over the adjoining slot, I had to develop a way to uh, make it smooth. So in the, uh, in the art glass field, when they make Tiffany lamps, they call them Tiffany shades, they use copper tape to encircle the glass and then solder them together. I use that copper tape as the contact for the car's brush to get electricity. That way it's nice and smooth. 
The reason I needed it smooth, Ryan, was because in my n main goal was to recreate a 132nd scale racetrack. And to do that, I needed a narrow track, a track that was to scale, rather than a track that was three and a half inches wide for four cars would be almost 28 inches wide. So in a nutshell, I thought, well, if I could group all four cars together on one side and then have a place for them to change lanes, they could pass one another. In other words, this Dodge right here is blocking this Mustang. When he gets to the hairpin turn, both have the opportunity to change to the opposite side of the track, and therefore they can pass each other. The first thing you got to say is they can block each other, but that's what real ca race cars do. So if both cars change lanes onto the opposite side, they'll begin to block each other again. And that's half the fun. Because when you get to the hairpin turn and change lanes, you got 150 feet to try to beat the other guy to the lane changer to block him. So it's a race within a race. And that's, what, that's how it differed from other slot car tracks. But the most important thing, Ryan, is it got the track to be narrow and I was able to create a uh, realistic layout and I get more racing in a given space yes yes exactly I can see that you know the scale of course is extremely important not only for detail but it adds that extra level of playability <laughs> yeah I mean it's it's very unique because as you said if the track is too wide it ain't you know it, it, ta it takes up space and you could space. pass each other yeah this adds the element of challenge which I'm sure right it is, is, uh, is it is a welcome it, it is tough for old school slot car racers guys my age who were used to being able to pass each other at will yeah. you can't do that here it's just like real racing there's a car ahead of you you got to do what you can to overtake them uh, more specifically we were looking at those cars on the track there yeah um, tell me about how they work a little bit tell me you know, well <coughs> see that you have a and B listed there. when I when I started this track all slot car tracks work on direct current, 12 volts, DC. And I raced four cars. Then I got the idea that if I could put two cars sharing one slot, which I know Eldon had done when I was a little kid, I didn't know how they did it. I realized that if I changed the polarity, this would be car A and the guy sharing the lane would be car B. If I could change his polarity around and switch the gear, he would still move forward. So I took two car batteries that were 12 volt DC and I fed them into the line and it worked for a while, but it began to overheat. My brother said, you know what? If you take an AC transformer, an alternating current transformer, which Lionel toy transformers are, toy train transformers, we could run two cars with the help of a diode, which is a one-way valve. So by inserting one seven cent diode into the cars, I was able to make one car sharing the lane, say A, move forward for one sixtieth of a second under your control. The next sixtieth of a second, it coasts, and car B gets the impetus to run based on car B's controller. It happens so fast, you don't even see it. The cars growl, and you get, you get a lot more control. You can make the car creep, where with DC, you can't. Once that, DC motor gets going, you have to get it going. And because I had the pit area and I have to come in, the added control was a, was a bonus. And I, I ran with it. I had uh, AC and DC for about four years and we totally stopped using the DC and went to A car. We call it AC two car, alternating current, two cars in one slot. It's an amazing system, I was just glancing at the power apparatus you had set up there. It's a Lion uh, Linus. It's a Lionel transformer. And uh, it's as simple as that. It, and uh, with a with a diode in each control and a diode in the car, we're able to run two cars at the same time in one slot. And it's it's been a success for over 14 or 15 years. And we we have yet to burn out a motor. There are those who told us you're going to burn out motors and we didn't. It, it runs great. It really does run great. It's kind of a, a kind of a trendsetter there. I mean, I can imagine people building tracks in future are gonna, you know, want to copy that design. You know. Well, I have a website, uh, uh, ac2car.org, and people as far away as New Zealand and Australia and Chile and Norway, and many guys in Belgium, 
uh, built tracks based on on my idea because you can get more racing. You're, you're packing packing it in. It's it's not only more racing; it's more complex. Oh, it is more complex, but so is real racing. Exactly. You know, it's easy to be able to hit the stop lights like that, and the red lights come on all around the track. I could have made it where it kills the power and everybody stops, but that's not what real racing is about. You see the red light, you've got to come to a stop. So I have the kids actually drive. That that was my that was my thoughts. If we go caution and yellow lights go on around the track, everybody keeps racing, but it it they have to listen to what driver is telling them about them sliding off the track at the at the at the shell corner, for example, and they can drive up to it. And one of our uh, one of our corner marshals would see the yellow lights and hear the buzzer and go get the car. It's great. It's a great system. It is. It is. It takes a while to get used to. And like I say, veterans of the old-fashioned way have the most trouble. Young guys, like you started when you were six or seven, uh, today you have no problem with it. Precisely. Speaking of uh, young racers and all that, I wanted to ask you real quick about the separation in the tracks there. So we have a set of three and a set of four. Can you tell me why that might be? Well, that happened because my youngest son, Danny, was about five when I designed the track. And I realized that at his age, he wasn't going to be able to handle lane changing. So what I did is I let lane four bisect the middle of the track, and it goes around without any, any lane changing. So these three guys are able to come to here. Today, the tracks I designed for people all the way up to Bobby Ray Hall's, you, you, you race four on one side and four on the other. To offset that and fix it years later, I put in a switch here. I think I don't know if you can see it, but the switch is right there. And all through this area right here, there's four on this side and four on that side. The guy sharing lane four, A and B, uh, just like real racing, if, if a car is absolutely slower uh, than the car behind him, he's to pull over and allow him by. So in this stretch, lane four can pass. Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. That's a cool little, you know, little detail. Just those. Oh little yeah. Stories, you know? uh, again, I've I've designed many tracks now with four and four. I I won't go that route. I just did it for Danny, but he's 40 years old now. He can handle it. He can. <laughs> I hope he can handle the lane changes, right? You know. But beyond all that, beyond uh, the technical aspect of this track, I know my dad touched on the the detailing, a little mm -hmm. bit, the, the scenery here. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what's left. So we're looking at the pits over there, right? And we're looking at what you pointed out will be a, a bridge uh -huh. soon enough. So just tell me what kind of plans you might have in the future for those areas. There's areas that are unfinished, and if you look at it close, you'll notice it. I start by planting figures and things in that might distract drivers or block their attention. And if they complain about it, then I move those figures before I finish the area. This area at the pit entrance still has to be completed, as does that wall. And then that far side there where the, the trucks are parked has to be detailed. And as we go up the carousel turn, there's going to be a uh, Michelin bridge coming across this way to that ESPN uh, TV tower. And then there's a catwalk, which is done. The catwalk's going to lead to a walk that crosses over the bridge. I've still got a lot of work to do, but you know what? That's what's fun about this. I make little sketches and I plan. And uh, sometimes I put things up like, if you notice in the pit area, there's some gray boxes and a clear box. I want to see if drivers complain about that. If they if they do complain about it, I've got to redo it and shorten it. At one time, I had a press tower that was going to be built over this set of stands. 90% of the tracks have that, but visibility was not going to be good. So now I'm going to move it to where it is at turn three in Daytona. It's going to be up above the entrance to the track. This is all going to get cut away. And there'll be a ticket booth inside there, and um, welcome to Northline Raceway signs flashing. I got all kinds of plans. These, this will be complete. This came out of a piano. I wanted them to be able to be able to flex so that when people hit them, they don't they don't break it. And then I've uh, successfully used wedding veil material as the uh, cyclone fencing across it. That was another thing that I was very impressed by, and that's something that Dad touched on. 
the material here, I mean, it's just genius. It's all <laughs> from another thing. I mean, you look at this, you know, I point that like, oh yeah, you know, that came from that came from my garage. That came from a piano. This is all this is all cardboard, scratch made. There's four layers of cardboard to make this thickness. As you can see, it's a compound turn. So I had to uh, dampen cardboard, glue it on, and lay it lay it, or lay it in place. It's pretty solid. Then I go back and I shade. And I found using uh, different colored chalks is the best. I can, I can create a rust look and uh, a old detailed look just with chalk and a brush. Speaking of that, you know, that, the crafting itself, mm -hmm. we're going to have you take us into your, your crafting area oh. and we can take a look at this. At, you know, the behind the scenes process. Yeah, right. Well, this is my work area. You know, I've got a, a paint booth right there that I, I, I use. Uh, and you know what, guys? I've put away my airbrush. I don't use my airbrush anymore. I'm able to uh, start by painting everything I do flat black, right off the bat. And then I mist it with the colors that I need, just out of aerosol, uh, aerosol cans. There's only one type that I use, the, the 2X Rust-Oleum. And it's, it's much easier to use. I don't have to clean the airbrush. I can just mist it on uh, and get the look that I'm looking for, and then I finish it with chalk. And I, and I uh, spray it with dull coat, and I get it to look as lifelike as I can. And then, not, not till then does it go onto the track. So basically, I'll, I'll lift off an area, and I'll bring it to my workbench, and we'll work on it here, lift it back, and put it on. Um, this area here, is dedicated to working on the tracks themselves, uh, the cars themselves. Uh, I've had so many friends crowding around here, uh, working on their cars, uh, that I decided to lift it up on milk crates and make it more accessible. And of course, since we're all getting older, we need we need the magnifier. <laughs> but I'm not. I, hey, I'm happy. I'm happy. You can see a lot of pictures on the wall of different tracks from around the world. These are my references. These are the references that I've collected all my life. And I've taken great pains to point out signs that I wanted to recreate, at turns I wanted to recreate. Even the cyclone fencing, I took these myself at the Detroit Grand Prix. Uh, and I take note of, of what size things are. I've gone as far as to have my son take pictures of me just under six feet tall next to things so that I could scale it, scale it up. This happens to be a Professor Motor's diagram of how to put the diode into your car. He did that for me, it's on his website. So guys, before they come here, can prep their diode into their car. It only costs seven cents. Um, I've been collecting pieces, like I told you, for building and making slot cars, I've still got cases and cases of unbuilt cars because I was saving them then in 1995 or so, they began recreating cars that I, better than I could ever make. I mean, they're almost bulletproof. The kids uh, and the adults smash them, crash them, things that would annihilate a car in the 60s. The cars, the, the models today still keep running. I remember. Uh, when I was a kid, flipping a car or two. So, oh yeah, oh uh, yeah. I can appreciate. Yeah, it didn't bother me unless it was mine, Ryan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Once I got my own, it was you know fair game. Now, as we look around again, you know the the inspiration that's awesome. But I'm starting to zone in on these posters you got on the wall. You know, just a little detail. Why don't you tell me about this? This is all again. Uh, it's it's reference material for myself. These were gifts from friends of mine that I helped work on their track. Uh, these these guys, I realized I was uh, short some uh, emergency crew members, so I painted them. And then at my leisure, when I'm camping, I'll, d I'll detail them. These guys are going to be crews in six safety trucks that will be around the track. So even though the track it looks detailed, it will come to life when all those figures are painted and are on the track. So these guys will, will be the track maintenance crew. Um, uh, this, this I... I got an estate sale and, and the poor guy painted this, he was a real race fan. I know because he had some great race books and uh, it, it, it broke my heart to see it 
Mexico Unsold. So I bought it. He had painted it, uh, and I, I felt sorry for him. He was, he was obviously a race enthusiast. So I wanted to, to hang it up for his sake. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful little story, just about a small piece of this room. Last question I have for you at the moment. Yes. Um, I want you to tell me specifically about some of the cars on here. You know, do you have a favorite? Oh have. yeah, definitely. I sh you know, again, I was telling your dad earlier that the the hobby of slot cars had deteriorated, and they had only they only made cars that they called womp womp cars, which didn't even look like cars. They were thingies to beat each other. They go so fast, three seconds a lap. It's just crazy. And I wanted a scale layout. And when I worked for Ford Motor Company on the Jaguar program, two British engineers who worked with me came to the Forge Engineering plant and they had heard about my track and they brought me this car. Now mind you, I didn't have any of these other cars. I had just scratch built models from uh, when I was a kid. And I was just enthralled by it. It, it was made by Fly and I just ate it. I, I was, I mean look at the detail on this car. Now today we're used to seeing models like this but Back in 1995, no way. And I got in touch with the hobby shop in London where they bought the car. He got them from a su supplier in Belgium, and I began to import them to guys at Ford Motor Company. They, they, they come in a nice uh, box, and they displayed them on their desks. And then on Wednesday, we'd come here and race at lunchtime. We had a Goodyear calendar at work, and uh, we'd do uh, three laps in time, and the guy with the best time would have his time put back on the calendar at work, so that others would uh, want to want to race. I had at least 12 or 15 friends uh, come four or five at a time to race. So those were good times. In fact, they're 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 touching base with me again, 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, I had a guy come knock on the door just two weeks ago. He said, "I used to race here. Do you remember me?" I said, "Yeah, of course I do, Ronnie." Oh, that's that's great. So once we did that, uh, the guys would uh, gift me with a car for importing them and getting them. And actually, half of these cars are a gift for helping people work on their track and, and giving them advice. Uh, on my website, uh, I would sit for hours giving guys advice and answering questions. But I, I got tired of the, um, what's the phrase they use, trolls? who are jealous of the fact that, you know, I've got a good thing going here, you know, they, they were into the old fashioned, real wide track and they didn't want them to do it. So they ran interference and it was difficult, but the guys in Chile, Argentina, I, uh, not Argentina, but Chile and Australia, New Zealand, bunch of guys in Belgium, even in Malta, my mom and dad's home country, uh, guys were building tracks and talking to me about it. It was, it was great fun. That's great, that's awesome. very much for talking with me today, of course, <laughs> for talking for, with my dad. We really of course, of it. course, of course. You know, you guys are doing me a favor talking about the track, now, presenting wonderful. it to everybody. Yeah, we've really enjoyed it's, our time. It's a, lifetime, it's a lifetime of work. I've been working on this thing for 35 years, but I love it. I loved every minute of it. It shows. This is, this is certainly a labor of love, you know, just passion all around in every corner. You know, oh. Something I was saying to uh, Derek, you know, our, our director before we came over here, is that you look around every nook and cranny, you'll find something that you didn't see before. <laughs> and I'm willing to help anybody else who, who would like to apply this, uh, my methods to, uh, to 132 scale racing and uh, make it look uh, like we're recreating vintage racing. Amazing. That's my goal. Well, thank you very much. Well, we'll have to have a race uh, on this track and display oh, yeah. it to all those sure. people out there. And come back when I, when I do the Michelin cor uh, carousel turn from Bridgehampton and and all the other things I want to finish, oh, cause yeah. especially the pit area, because oh. the track is not done yet. It's living, just like my dad said. It's a living track, <laughs> and it's going to continue. I, I, I would, I am absolutely sure. Well, thank you again. All right, so great. Much. It was my pleasure. All right, thank you everyone for joining us in this truly special event that we have going here. I think you guys 
you know, just along with me here, have really come to appreciate everything that Uncle Jim has put into this track. The heart, the soul, every ounce of detail. So I hope that you guys will, will like this video, will drop a subscribe to the channel. We will continue to update you as the track gets more and more complex and detailed. Truly, this is an amazing thing. Uh, and speaking for myself and for everybody that's come with me today, uh, we can't thank Uncle Jim enough for inviting us over and just showing us his passion, showing us his, his you know, labor of love, his life's work here. So once again, be sure to drop a like and subscribe. Uh, leave a comment with any questions you have. We'll pass them along to Uncle Jim for sure. And visit his website. He mentioned it early in the interview. So be sure to visit his website as well if you'd like to see a little bit more. And, you know, we'll continue to update you. I hope you guys have enjoyed. Signing off.